Columbia, a second one, a second one from the Graduate College ARTES from the University of Colón, and the last one, the National Scholarship from the Instituto Colombiano de Antropología e Historia, ICAN. In her work, Dr. Mantilla combines landscape archaeology with oral history, ethnography, and material culture studies to research the warfare, rebellion, and resistance practices of the Afro-descendant communities uh, located at the north coast of Colombia in the region of Los Montes de Maria. And she has published in Spanish and Portuguese and will be publishing in English soon as well. Um, and we can share a whole list of her publications in the, in the chat with you in a second. Um, and today we are delighted to host Dr. Mantilla for, uh, to speak for this Garrett seminar series on the topic of landscapes of freedom, kinship relations, and geographical imagination of the Maroon of La Sierra de la Maria during the 17th century Colombia. The presentation will take about 45 minutes and it will be followed by a question and answer session of about 30 minutes. We will be recording this session, so please be aware and keep your cameras off if you do not wish to appear in the recording. And we will disable the chat during the talk, but we will turn it back on for the Q&A. So please hold on to your questions until then. And with that, we welcome Dr. Mantilla to uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Oliver, for your kind words. And, and um, so, of course, I would like to thank you, Oliver Ansek and Joshua Fitzieral, for inviting me to participate um, to the Gabriel Research Seminar Series. For me, it's an honor being here today and having the chance to dialogue with extraordinary colleagues from different parts of the globe. I hope to create through my talk an atmosphere that allowed us to navigate through the different historical nuances of the colonial marriage. As you can see, based on the title of my presentation, I will focus today on two main aspects of those nuances, the kinship relations and the geographical imagination of the maroon that used to inhabit it at the north coast of what nowadays is Colombia in South America during the 17th and 18th century. Please the following slide. The main argument that I would like to share, oh, no, no, back, thank you. <laughs> the main argument that I would like to share with you today is that marronage was not only a tactic to avoid slavery, but rather an act of creation. That is to say, Africans and African descendant population had continuously to create new conditions of living in order to maintain their pursuit of freedom. This is pointed out the fact that marronage was not a stable, neither an homogeneous, uh, homogeneous phenomenon. Nevertheless, focusing on kinship relations and on the geographical imagination allowed us to follow the paths that historical subjects took on their journey of becoming free people. Thus, these two dimensions emphasize the power of marronage on shaping landscapes that in this case, I have called a landscape of freedom. Please, please the, the next one. To develop this main argument, I have decided uh, to divide my talk today into four parts. In the first, I will introduce the current situation of the communal lands of San Basilio de Palenque and La Bonga. In the second one, I will switch to the historical case, introducing the emergence and persistence of relation that a group of Palenques or Maroon settlements had along the 17th and 18th century in the mountains of Maria. Here I will focus on the spatiality dimension of that kinship relation. Uh, on the third part, I will present the results of the archaeological work conducted on the communal lands of San Basilio de Palenque and La Bonga, and I will end this part by referring to the geographical imagination as a flexible perspective when capturing the power of marronage as an act of creation. Finally, I will conclude this talk by remarking the contributions of this investigation to the historical and archaeological analysis of the maroon societies and the formation of Palenque in Colombia and in extent in Latin America. I hope this case study and its analysis will inspire further communal research and dialogues with all the colleagues working on similar cases in all the parts of the globe. 
So, next, please. So here we can see, oh, no, just uh, the previous one, please. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky. Sorry. Um, so here we can see, of course, the location of the common lands of San Basilio de Palenque and Lavonga at the north coast of Colombia, uh, which is uh, more or less 60 kilometers far away from Cartagena de Indias. Um, I would like also to apologize for the bad quality of the image that uh, that you have on the right side of the slide. But I do, but I hope you can see at least the red line that is that delimitates the current territory of the Palenqueros and Bungueros. So we are talking about of an extension of 7,304 hectares, that is around uh, 73 square kilometers, right, in which you can see also three main areas. The one where San Basilio is located at the north, right? The other one at the south where is La Bonga, and in the middle we can see Angola. I must say that La Bonga was inhabited until 2002, when due to a paramilitary attack, the inhabitants were forced to abandon the area. And I'm not sure um, how many of you are familiar with the uh, armed conflict that uh, is happening in Colombia, but in the mountains of Maria, unfortunately, we have had the guerrillas, which is the left-wing group, and the paramilitaries, the right-wing group, moving through it since the 80s. The situation adds a layer of conflict and tension, letting us vividly seeing and understanding that the struggles uh, for inhabiting peacefully in a peacefully uh, uh, place, let's say, are not just a historical issue. This abandonment of La Bunga led the Bungueros and the result, uh, sorry, to resettle in San Basilio de Palenque and some other nearby towns. When I visited Palenque for the first time in 2007, uh, seven, sorry, I noticed that each day the Bungueros will go to La Bunga and return to Palenque on the same day. And we are talking that the distance between San Basilio de Palenque at the north and La Bunga is depending on where exactly you are going, around 10 to 12 kilometers um, far away. So that means that the Bungueros are going and coming back. They are, they are doing like 10 kilometers each way, right? So that is 20 kilometers per day. Although there are, were no houses in the area anymore, they kept looking for their animals and their crops. The regularity of this movement led me soon to understand it's important at, that this was an important tactic through which people keep their relation with their former dwelling places. So um, now I will have to, if you, if you may, but because I want to show a video, a short video, in order to give you an idea how Palenque look like nowadays, right? So, but but because it's exactly so, but because it's in the uh, the slide, so I will have to share my screen right now. Just a second, wait. Sure. And because I, oops, sorry. <laughs> here I do have. Oh, sorry, I do have the video here. So, let's see if. Uh, Let's see if you can see it. Please let me know. So, oh, oops, you are seeing it, right? Or no? Do I have to share the screen again? Yes, we see it. We see it. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, great, great. So this is Palenque de San Basilio. Oh, San Basilio de Palenque, sorry, my mistake. Um, and what you are seeing here, right? I'm going to stop right now, right here. Um, what you are seeing here is the main entrance to the uh, settlement, right? So uh, we find we have here the cemetery, right, at this area, right, uh, at the beginning of the settlement, and we and you can see here what we call or what is locally known as the main street, la calle principal, right? So I want to call your attention about. Um, um, on three particular aspects, the location of the cemetery, the location of the church, 
that you are seeing here and as well the, the location itself of the houses of the settlement itself um, on the lower parts of this area right so we have um we have uh, this um, this view nowadays right in which the main streets and some others would look like really straight right and like a straight line but this view this perspective is happening or start to be being shaped let's say in the last uh, 40 to 30 years right in particular we have um, uh, some architectonical decisions that has been made in the last 20 years that added a layer here you can see maybe later um uh, pedestrian uh, like way right so this is adding extra um information let's say in order to point it out or to show it as a straight street but uh, the reason why i'm saying this is because of course it's important to know to understand the spatial transformations of these places in order also to get a better idea how they looked in the past right so also you are seeing here of uh, this big church, let's say, and it, it was renovated in 2014, right, before what we had was a small chapel that was built already in uh, over the ruins of the old chapel that was uh, made by wood, uh, or of wood, sorry. So we have here um, also this mountains in the area, right? So right behind these mountains, 10 kilometers to 12 kilometers, depending on where exactly are you going, you will find the older settlement or the area where used to be La Bonga, right? The houses of La Bonga. So again, it's important to emphasize, right? The place where Palenque itself um, uh, is right in the lower part of these mountains. So let me show you just a little bit more to give you an idea, right, um, how Palenque looked like um, and where, of course, uh, my research took place. I'm going to just, as you see, that's what I'm saying here. This, this idea of a straight uh, street is quite new in the sense that it started to happen to 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 have this form this shape in the last 40 years right so we have also here what we could call the like a square right the, the main square of the of the town but this main square and i'm doing this quote mark quoting marks just to emphasize that this was built in 2011 so before that right this area was used to uh for the for the how do you say for resting the cattle right so we have in all uh, we will see later we have a lot of um uh, uh, cattle rising in the territories of san basilio de palenque so until let's say the last 40 uh, years more or less we uh, the people i mean the, the palenqueros uh, used to to bring their cattle and put it in this area what this is telling us of course is the transformations that uh, that is uh, that are happening right in san basilio de palenque most important in the last 40 years right so i'm gonna just um leave it there and please uh um, oliver if you could again share your screen i'm gonna stop sharing right just to continue with the presentation thank you so sorry i was looking for the video um wait a second because it's coming so you can you can you can have the following uh, slide please so and, and uh, that is um i mean in 2017 i had the uh final the, the possibility right of um of uh, visiting la bonga uh, colombia was celebrating the results of the last um peace agreement let's take it with one year before 
in 2016 with the FARC, with the guerrillas, and on the air uh, there was this feeling of hope for a better future. In the mountains of Maria, as in many other rural areas in, of Colombia, this meant a quiet period, right? So in that sense, it was possible again to think about doing archaeology in this area. What you are seeing here is the place where until 2002 used to be some houses. We can see here some uh, old foundations of that, uh, that houses, as well as the path regularly followed by the former inhabitants of La Bonga. In the present, the Bongueros are using these areas, as you can see maybe, uh, both, I hope so, uh, the, uh, the first um, picture uh, at the right side, you can see a corn crop, right? So. Uh, all this area where the houses used to be uh, now are using for cultivating proposes, purposes. So now um, I want to share with you also a video of Angola, uh, but I'm guessing it's going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, if you can stop again and I will show you the video, uh, just to uh, again briefly um, uh, show you the wait a second sorry here um, uh, in order to give you an idea of what i'm talking about i mean how this landscape uh look like right so um wait, sorry one second let me see if it's working here oh, sorry so this is uh, this is more or less the way um or yeah the, the old path the old route of going to uh, La Bonga and uh, and in the middle, as you can see, as, as you can, as you saw on the first map, we are going to find this um, area named or known as La Bonga. But let me let me stop here just for a second. Um, sorry, uh, this. Let me uh, just show you. This is the video that I wanted to share. Sorry. So just to give you an idea, right? So how it La bon uh, sorry, Angola look like. And here is important some other features of the landscape, right? So we are seeing here already a landscape that uh, uh, is in relation with cattle. Uh, or cattle rising, sorry. So uh, you can see here a few cattle, a few cows over here, right? But what I wanted to point it out uh, from this uh, image, right, is um, it's something that we are not seeing in particular. So you can see here a small plantain crop, but we cannot see because of the perspective, right? The two houses that are here. What is important to keep in mind is that this pattern of dwelling is typical from the uh, communal lands of San Basilio Palenque. That is to say that we could find or we are going to find two, three, four, five until six houses uh, scattered over the landscape with a few crops and some cattle rising uh, as well, right? So here in this area of um, Angola, uh, we can find also um, some, um, what was the, the name for that, a small, um, uh, it's a water stream, I think it's the word in English, right? So uh, it's it's over here, right? And uh, everything that you were seeing right here in this image or in this video actually are part is part of the communal lands of San Basilio de Palenque. So you can you can um, imagine how, in a sense, difficult was and how challenging was trying to identify places, right, that uh, were um, historically connected with, or were connected with the historical marriage, right? Um, so that's uh, just to give you a general idea of how uh, the communal lands of San Basilio de Palenque uh, look like nowadays, right? So I'm going to leave it there and um, stop sharing my screen. And please, um, Joshua, again, sorry for this situation. But anyway, so um, 
write the following one, please. So just to just to uh, do a brief um, uh, resume, let's say, or uh, to summarize some of the ideas or things that I have mentioned until now, when talking about com the communal lands of San Basilio de Palenque and Lavonga, we are referring to a current territory whose extension uh, is about 33 square kilometers, right? In which we find settlements of different size that are coexisting uh, as one um, listed on the slide, right? We are also referring to a mountain landscape in which three main water streams flows, right? And one next to San Basilio de Palenque, the other one next to Angola, and finally one more next to La Bonga. But to talk about the communal lands also implies a dimension of the armed the abandonment of La Bonga and some other villages in 2002. And here I forgot to mention when I was saying that uh, we find when I was showing the video of Angola, right? So that we have this pattern of dwelling, right? Two, three, four houses, five houses. We had. Uh, as well, in 2002, three uh, other small villages, uh, Criollo, Culebra, and Casingui, that uh, which, uh, whose inhabitants also had to leave because of the paramilitary attacks, right? And this is important, as you will see, because uh, what it seems to be quite, let's say, new as soon as we start to add the historical layer and the archaeological one we what we are going to see is a persistent right in a pattern of well of dwelling right um but i'm gonna um add and develop this idea later on so next one uh, in other words in uh, what we are saying when thinking about uh san basilio de palenque and la bonga the communal lands we are referring, of course, to an ongoing process of spatial and architectonical transformation. But there is another layer related to the inhabitants of the communal lands of San Basilio and La Bonga, uh, that, uh, and of course, it's in fact the cultural and the social dimension. So a good example that summarizes how this other two dimension have been considering in the past um, is, for instance, the declaration made by UNESCO uh, in 2005 about San Basilio's community as immaterial world heritage. Uh, this declaration focused on three main characteristics of this community, the Creole spoken language, right, the social organization, the quagros, and the lumbalu, which are um, particular funeral rituals. I don't have the time to explain each of them, right? So I will just mention some important features of the first two one. This to emphasize again, the richness and complexity of the social context in which this research took place. So the follow one, please. So Palenquero is currently uh, the um, uh, Creole language, right? So it's spoken in San Basilio de Palenque, and it was also in the past spoken in La Bonga. It's the only Creole language related to Spanish in the Americas. The old ones, like Papiamento in Curaçao, or the Creole in Haiti, or the Creole English spoken um, in San Andres Providence and Santa Catalina in Colombia or in Jamaica, received influence from Dutch, English, or French, right? So linguists uh, like Armin Schwiegler had previously demonstrated that Palenquero has been also influenced by the Kikongo of Central Africa, right? In a sense, what I want to share with you is this idea that, of course, when uh, talking about the Creole language, we are also talking of, of a way of thinking and being in the world that has been inherited through different generations in this community, right? And this is showing also a complex process, right, of negotiations from people coming from different areas, um, from the historical perspective, let's say, through uh, Cartagena, in Cartagena de Indias. So the big question here is how this happens, right? How these negotiations, these tensions as well, um, uh, did, let's say, create a new Creole language like Palenquero. So next one, please. 
As we will see, uh, the historical data indicates the presence of individuals from Central Africa since the early phase of the formation of the Maroon communities in the first half of the 17th century. This, this is, uh, of course, um, in relation with the demography of the, and I, again, I do this quoting more slave trade. I'm pretty aware that now the name have been changing. We are not naming that anymore as a slave trade. So I apologize um, for that. But so um, what I wanted to emphasize is that uh, this information, right, of people coming uh, during the first half of the 17th century from Central Africa is in relation with the demography, right, of this slave trade uh, that was happening uh, or taking place uh, back then through Cartagena de Indias, as is shown on the slide, right? So the next one. And in this universe, uh, let's say, um, a social context, we also have uh, a particular social organization, right, in the communities, in particular in the community of San Basilio. And one uh, notorious um, um, uh, structure, let's say, is the existence of the Cuagros. This is an association of men and women that has two heads, one female and another, and one male. As Nina de Friedman uh, mentioned in the past, she was, and I have to say, she was one of the first uh, women anthropologists in Colombia uh, that uh, developed or conducted uh, research with uh, Afro-descendant communities back in the 70s. So, as she um, mentioned in the past, the Cuagro also implied, and I quote, a kind of war games through which the community has celebrated its memory of rebellion. Until recently, groups of children and young people formed gangs as part of village festivities in June and December. The male and female Cuagros of each half of the village were in a fight with the other half, end of the quote. So what I wanted to, um, to uh, or show with this slide, I want to call your attention to the draw, right, that we have on the left. What we are seeing here is a mixture that was a draw that made by uh, Nina Friedman back in the 70s, right? And we are what we are seeing here is, uh, let's say, the result of um, relation between kinship relationships and uh, the cont uh, contiguity of residence that has been shaping this sort of compounds, right? So on the right, um, you are seeing a picture also taken by, um, well, she was, she didn't take that picture, but uh, um, from the work from Nina Friedman. Um, uh, so this sort of compounds, right, looked like back in the 70s. And we may have had find this um, architectonical or this is um, this um, um, a way of organizing, let's say, um, the houses, we may, may have find this um, probably until the beginning of the 90s, right? So in the last, um, so since the 2000 until the present, this has been changing a lot, right? So we can, we can um, if you want, we can discuss that later um, uh, um, after I finish my talk, why this is happening, right? But what I wanted to call your attention again is to this sort of uh, spatiality of the social relations, right? And this is important also because you can see here the black houses here that would, used to be, uh, used to leave, sorry, the captain of that cuadro, right? So we have this, um, Arriba and abajo, this up and down, this is marking the division, the special division that still uh, um, you find in San Basilio de Palenque. We have two main neighborhoods, uh, Barrio Arriba and Barrio Abajo, and the relation, right, the relation between these two halves is still, still happening. So uh, without knowing Right, this is going to play an important um, role, let's say, on the development of my research. Because basically, uh, what I'm going to show you 
in the following uh, minutes is also right a focus on how this uh, the historical kinship relationship uh, or the special dimension sorry of the historical uh, kinship relationship right so this give this idea this representation uh, made by um uh, nina friedman and her information as well ethnographical information um gave me the possibility also to think right to make connections um about what was happening in the past so next one please you can see here uh, the professor um achilles escalante historian on the left and one picture as well from nina de friedman so although some authors as the, as the ones that, that you were seeing on slide had previously mentioned the relation between san basilio and the colonial marronage as well as the african diasporic diasporic dimension of that link right so with information regarding possible places of origins and also the historical dimension of the cultural practices until the proposal of this research the spatial and material component of that historical link was unexplored. In that sense, this research shed light on the way that Marronage created new political, social and material conditions for the Maroons and so shaped a landscape that, as I previously mentioned, I have called a landscape of freedom in Los Montes de Maria or the Mountains of Mary during the 17th and 18th centuries. So next one, please. In this context, right, in, to, in which I was interested on to follow this uh, material and special link, uh, um, a special dimension of that historical link, four were the main questions that guide my analysis. How population of African origins in the old province of Cartagena, or Cartagena's old province, had access to the land and retained its control in a period of time in to which slavery was a legal institution, which were the constitutive characteristics of the marronage that took place in, the, in this province, where, how, and when did the Palenques or Maroon settlements emerge? What is the material culture of marronage and the act of freedom, uh, which is, uh, yeah, right. Um, and what does it tell us, right, about the living conditions of the historical inhabitants of those palenques? So next one, please. In that sense, or in order to answer uh, these questionings, right, um, oh, sorry, um, I, um, um, I, I have here a problem with the battery. Just a second. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My, my apologies. So, um, uh, so sorry. Um, I was saying that in order to answer these questionings, I applied a methodology of historical archaeology in which I combine archival research and archaeological analysis, right? And, uh, of material culture connected with the phenomenon of marronage and the following act of freedom. On the one hand, I identify social and political characteristics of the relation between the inhabitants of those palenques, as well as, uh, as the relations that they maintain with the colonial authorities of Cartagena. On the other, I documented the spatial mobility architectural characteristics of these settlements and material culture connected with the daily life occurred in those palenques. So what you are seeing here, right, is a, um, um, uh, just an example, right, of what I was doing uh, during my research, right? So I work with different sort of um, historical written sources, from Archivo General de Indias, Archivo Nacional Histórico de Madrid and Spain, but also with the Archivo General Nacional in Colombia, right? And after pursuing this analysis, this historical analysis, right, I also, I then um, developed the archaeological analysis, right? So, um, uh, the next one, please. With a specific emphasis in Cartagena's old province and in Los Montes de Maria, 
that is marked in yellow, right? I studied then the emergence and persistence of a group of five free black communities known as Palenques. Some of them emerged in the middle of the 17th century, while others, as in the case of San Basilio de Palenque, will persist beyond the military attacks of this period until the present. In order to offer a historical perspective about the ongoing process of creation, now I will turn into the story of some of those maroons that inhabited in Los Montes de Maria. So the next one, please. Around the prob probably year of 1629, Lucia de Castangola was on her way to pick up some ashes in the Tejada, the Lara outside the wall of Cartagena de Indias. Somewhere along the way, close to the gate of La Media Luna, one of the main entrances to the city, she was captured by a group of maroons. The follow one, please. Although the precise route followed by Lucia and the Maroons remains unknown, according to the declarations made by some of her descendants in Cartagena in 1697, she ended up living in the neighboring province of Santa Marta, in a palenque close to the Magdalena River. Following Francisca Sangola's declaration, Lucia's oldest daughter, while in this palenque, her mother had been at the same time with Agustin Angola, Francisca's father, and Domingo Endongo. Next one, please. Lucia will die in this palenque, while Agustin and Francisca will head up years later to the already existing, pal uh, existing palenque of Domingo Angola in the mountains of Maria. According to Pablos, a maroon from a nearby Palenque known as Gambanga, their places suffered the constantly attack of the Indios Bravos or Indios Chimila. In addition, a military entrance executed by the governor of Cartagena, Don Pedro Zapata, in, in 1651, will drive the final abandonment of these two Palenques. Next one, please. Some other Maroons declare that after Francisca's arrival, the Palenque of Domingo Angola will be renamed as El Arenal. In the settlement, in this settlement, sorry, will be born her daughter Felipa and her granddaughter Jacinta. Magdalena, another Francisca's daughter, mentioned in her statement to the colonial authorities of Cartagena that some Maroons will move later to another Palenque named as Enduanga. Magdalena, Felipa, and Jacinta will also live there until the military entrance of 1694. This attack will partially destroy these two palenques and another one named as San Miguel. Following, please. Either because they have claimed to be born in one of those palenques or to have lived in a particular one, all Francisca's children are linked to at least one of the four mentioned palenques. Besides illustrating, illustrating sorry, the existence of a relation between the settlements, this case makes possible to follow that, the, that Maroons from the same kinship split from it and move to another area. There, a new palenque will emerge. The pre-existing kinship relations, as well as all the created over time, will operate as bonds of belonging and articulation between the indicated settlements. So, next one, please. Those palenques of the mountains of Maria that arose after the arrival, or that emerged after the arrival of Agustin, Francisca, Pablos, and their descendants, places in an environment of rural interaction, right? In each of these settlements, the Maroons did plant, plant corn, rice, beans, jam, cassava, and plantain, while they had animals like pigs and chickens. In others, they planted cotton as well. Discuss it somewhere else as the botanical gardens of the dispossessed. Within the framework of this research, the recurrence of such crops over time indicates a long line of transmission of knowledge and shared learnings. 
Next one, please. This allows significantly expanding the understanding around the extension of a palenque. This is not limited to the locations of the Boios, but rather it extends between the mountains and, wa I mean, and, and, and watery lands, let's say, where their crops and their animals are located. And it will include also the routes and roads that connect with other settlement. Next one, please. Oh, um, so just to, just to uh, I would like to add a few uh, other thing here, and that is that after the previous military entrance um, uh, of uh, the end of the 17th century in 1694, San Miguel was reconstructed. Nicolás de Santa Rosa Domingo Angola son appears in 1740 as the new captain of the Maroons of Mountains of Maria. He will finally sing up. Uh, sing the agreement with the colonial authorities through which the Maroons became legally free. This historical context led me to the identification of different spatial characteristics of the colonial marronage of this period, right? So just to mention a few of them, uh, referring to the, to the first half of the 17th, uh, sorry, 18th century, San Miguel persists and is in relation to the three other smaller settlements. In the 17th century, this is still considered as the main settlement of the Maroons. This articulation of sites is anything but apparent. It weighs to a particular way of conceiving social and spatial organization, which has been set up throughout the 17th century, right? In that sense, the kinship articulations create a particular pattern of settlement, right? Which in the meantime, did produce a landscape associated with freedom in the mountains of Maria during the second half of the 17th century and the following one. Freedom of taking decisions about to whom can I marry, where can I settle down, cultivate or hunt, freedom of moving between different places. So um, what you are seeing here in this slide is part of, um, let's say, uh, my interest, right, on uh, analyzing the historical written sources. So what I did also just to summarize was to identify the main characteristics, right, of uh, the emergence of um, maroon settlement along the 17th and 18th century. What you are seeing here, uh, the single settlements articulated on persistence of articulation, are the main characteristics of that process, right? This is not in any case a linear process. I'm just referring to it um, like what was the main characteristic right of this period of time so we have for instance at the beginning of the 17th century based on the written sources we know that at least the majority of the maroon settlements of the Cartagena's old province but also from Santa Marta's old province at the other side of the Magdalena River are being perceived right as single settlements again it doesn't mean that there are not articulations but it's just um, um allowed us to identify that there is a main characteristic of this of of the settlements being like alone right so we have during the second half of the 17th century we start to see another sort of reports, another sort of information that is pointed out the fact that now we have, at least it's, not, it's obvious, a process of articulation, right? So, and along the 17th, 18th century, sorry, we will see how this articulation that also had different nuances, but I'm not going to explain right now, um, uh, persist through time, right? So again, this is connected with the idea that marronage was not a homogeneous process. So next one. So following the results of the historical analysis and the spatial nuances of marronage, I decided to concentrate the archaeological survey in three specific areas of the communal lands of San Basilio de Palenque and La Bonga, right? One area close to the settlement of San Basilio, 
the second one on the settlement itself of San Basilio, and finally in the settlement of La Bonga. The collected material culture show a, a wide variety of colonial, republican, and contemporary ceramics on pottery, right? I, in total, I identify 33 different types of it, from which two correspond to types of pottery. Next one. Please. So, in addition, um, 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 with uh, in addition to the um, um, pottery and ceramics, there are also uh, metal objects that, unfortunately, because now we are seeing the the, the slides on the PDF, is not showing the picture that was before that was from the metal objects, right? But nevertheless, we have uh, some fragments of bullets. Uh, spl splinters or bullet shares and possible fragments of weapons such as muskets. We identify also different type of glass objects from the colonial, republican and present times. Next one. Um, sorry, well, well, it doesn't matter. So finally, there are there is also an important amount of final remains, um, but I will just now refer to the ceramic and pottery fragments, right? So we have here on this slide, you can see uh, the majority of the evidence was uh, ceramic and pottery, right? From then, uh, from the total of the collected fragments of ceramic and pottery, 3,500 in total, it is to remark the identification of fragments of um, three particular types of, of ceramics produced in Cartagena, the Indies, between 1650 and 70, uh, let's say the end of the 18th century. And this was produced by women and men of African origins uh, in the Tejar of San Bernabe in Cartagena, the Indies. Uh, they were producing the producing sorry, different objects like botijas for storing water, oil, wine, as well as other objects like vessels, plates, and chandeliers. In other words, they were producing the ceramics of everyday life in the colonial city. In the same way, I identify some of the fragments of majolicas like Columbia Plain, as well as um, a little bit like um, maybe problem problematic because it doesn't have a quite clear um, classification, but in other contexts of the Caribbean, it's known as hard paste majolica, right? So the next one, please. In this same assemblage of material culture, I identify a new type of pottery, which I have it uh, classified as palenque crema burdo. Then this new type is related to the local production that occurred in the settlement of San Basilio de Palenque and its surroundings until the middle of the 20th century. Its appearance along the archaeological record in association to different ceramics assemblage led me to suggest that this may have been an activity already present in the since the since colonial period. Three possible ways, of course, of acquisition of these objects by the Maroons, through and in particular, of course, the ones coming from Cartagena de Indias and from the Caribbean region, through the contact, of course, with the colonial authorities, through the access to the trade before and after the agreement of. Uh, 1714 and uh, that uh, that gave uh, the um, the inhabitants of San Basilio de Palenque the legal recognition of their freedom and finally because of the relation that they continue uh, continue to have with the enslaved uh, and free population of the haciendas and some other settlements uh, like for instance Mompox over the Magdalena River so next one and I'm, I'm about to conclude. So, um, there is something that uh, if um, if you please, Oliver, uh, go uh, can could you please two again uh, the the first one, the first no, the, uh, not the first one, but I mean before, before, just move again before, before, sorry, and again and again. So there, just stay there. No, no, where is the map? Sorry. So I just want to point it out something um, that is not being shown clearly in on the slide that I had because of the PDF, but and it's something uh, 
um, is the connections between the sites, right? So based on the similarity of the collected material culture, in particular regarding the ceramic and pottery assemblage, I suggest the historical connections of the prospected areas. This evidence indicates as well the long period of occupation of this area, at least related to the last 300 years. Finally, the archaeological evidence offers a new perspective in the Colombian historical archaeology to discuss the occurrence of marronage and its implication. The Africans and African descendants did not break the relation with the colonial society. They changed the place from which they interacted with it, actively participating in its making by shaping the time with their hands and producing a long lasting landscape of freedom. So please now change the slide again. Yeah, stay there, please. So this, uh, the, the um, putting in the dialogue, different sort of um, of information, right? So that ethnographical information or data, as well as the archaeological data and the historical one, uh, allows me also to suggest, right, or, or to mention, uh, underline two substantial elements of the spatiality of the Palenques, right? So in a sense, what we have is uh, an important knowledge of the inhabitants of those areas, right, that uh, gave them the possibility to have access to the land, but also to control it over the time. That uh, is, um, we can use the idea of the geographical imagination, right, in order to understand this network of population, the possibilities of a regular mobility between different points of the mountain, and in that sense, extend the spectrum of known and appropriated space, right? So in other words, that means that for instance, when happening a military attacks from the colonial authorities during the 17th century, but as well along the 18th century, the Maroons are going to move to particular areas, of course, that they knew already. So they had an advantage in comparison with the to the colonial authorities, right? So this this uh, possibilities of protection, right, of, of hiding from the military attacks, but also this diagram that you that uh, I was showing you, right, the kinship relations is pointed out again, the fact that we are talking uh, in um, Tatsächlich, this is a German story. <laughs> we are talking in reality about, right, um, a freedom that has been constructed over the time with different layers, right? And if we add the archaeological data, again, we are seeing, right, that um, that Maronus was uh, what I was mentioned before. Maronus did not meant. The, to break with the colonial society, right? We are talking about then from a uh, ongoing process of uh, changing the political status, the political situation and the political arena from which the Maroons are interacting with the society. So next one, and I will conclude then. Uh, something, yeah. Well, I, I just, I just, as you saw before, there was uh, two. Uh, you are seeing here a word in Spanish, which is, which is this word, and this word meant, or I used that in order to, or it means in Spanish to overcome, right? So, so if we think, for instance, um, water, right? So we have a river, and you build up uh, a wall, right? If the water keep coming, keeps coming it's going to come a point in which right so the water is going to to overcome let's say the world so that's the idea of this border right with this concept i wanted to emphasize what i have previously mentioned right so uh the colonial marronage did imply and to overcome the colonial intentions of control so and this is um possible to argument or to argue based on the uh, ethnographical data in the sense that marronage was not 
only a process happening in the past that came to an end and voila, we are talking about that they were able to create particular landscapes that are still right existing not only in the case of colombia but also in the case of jamaica in the case of suriname so we are talking about uh, a process right that had different layers so the archaeological data at a layer that allowed us to understand a broader in a wider perspective the relations that those maroons had in the past right with the colonial society so uh, next one, please. Based on the results of this investigation, it's possible to understand how marronage was not only a tactic to avoid slavery, but rather an art of creation. That is to say, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Africans and African descendants who fled and inhabited in the Palenques had to create new material and social conditions in order to preserve the new achieved autonomy that had as a result the emergence and persistence of a particular landscape of freedom constituted, and that is the key aspect of everything here, by a network of settlement with regular interaction with each other. Uh, next one. As one of my goals was to identify where did the Palenques emerge, but also why and how did they persist in the old province of Cartagena, I have paid closer attention on one hand to the descriptions made by the colonial authorities about these places and their inhabitants. On the other, I try to hear the, hear the voices, always with quotation marks, of the Maroons to comprehend their actions and intentions regarding the emergence of those palenques and their persistence through time. Their persistence through time. Next one. The archaeological survey conducted for the first time on a place directly connected with the colonial marronage in Colombia has shown the active role of the historical inhabitants of those places. The richness of the archaeological record offers new information regarding the connections that the Maroons maintain with other African and African descendants enslaved or free population, for instance, like I mentioned before, in Cartagena de Indias or other Spanish settlement. Next one. The identification of a new a type of pottery arise new questions in the context of the Colombian archaeology. Since when did pottery production exist in San Basilio de Palenque and its surroundings? Who made it and where and how did they learn to produce it? While answering these questions requires further research, I suggest I suggested the hypothesis that this may have been an active already present activity, sorry, already present since colonial times. In that sense, the coexistence of different material culture and the local pottery of uh, production in San Basilio, the Palenque, opened the door, opens the door for future future analysis of the pottery production, not only in the case of this community, but also in other Afro-descendant communities of the mountains of Maria and Colombia in extent. So I wanted to thank all of you. And again, please, uh, I, I give you my sincere apologies for uh, the delay uh, that happened at the beginning. Thank you so much. And I will be willing to, yeah, to answer your questions or comments. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and I give mean, a round of applause for that presentation. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm going to be um, handling the Q&A session now that we're going to start. Um, we do have enough time. Thank you for um, uh, working with me as I was manipulating your slides. Sorry, I was trying to let people in. And so anyway, we'll get right into uh, the question and answer. And I'll, I'll go ahead and open up the uh, chat uh, window as well, the, the chat function as well. Um, and oh, sorry, I'm, I'm Josh Fitzgerald. I'll just be uh, facilitating the Q&A. Um, to begin with, um, I, 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 you know, I 
to, I do have a, several questions myself. I thought the talk really resonated with what I, I know from uh, the work of Cynthia Radding in Mexico, in the Sonoran Desert, and her work, uh, uh, it's uh, Power and Landscape uh, Identity, uh, Landscapes of Power and Identity, uh, which I thought it just felt really um, interesting to see the connections there. Um, but I won't uh, gobble up the time. If you have a question, please go ahead and use the raise uh, hand feature uh, underneath your reactions. You can click the button. Okay, great. We have first one from Beatrice. Uh, please go ahead and, and unmute yourself and, and you can ask Katerina uh, your question. Um, thank you, Katerina, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, very comprehensive. Um, I, uh, I was wondering whether you could maybe um, comment or develop a little further um, your work with the communities in Palenque and how they continue to understand the landscape for instance. Uh, thank you very much, Beatrice, for um, this um, question, because of course, gave me, gave me the chance to talk a little bit more with, more about the um, other dimension, right, of um, the research. As I mentioned at the beginning, just briefly, we are talking about, um, not only in the case of uh, the community of San Basilio Palenque and La Bonga, but we are talking, we're facing, right, also a uh, context of conflict, right, and current con uh, conflict happening in different parts of Colombia. And this is also affecting uh, the communities, right, in particular affecting their lives. Nevertheless, and, and the reason why I was mentioned that at the beginning was also to emphasize how important it is to think about uh, not only because of the safety but uh, the implications right of our work in the communities that we are working with so while we are thinking about right yes how fantastic a history and uh, material record and so on right the people the local ones are fighting and struggling with other aspects and this is an important dimension that we need to face right so one of the things that uh, the things that i've uh, been doing and learning through the process, of course, of being uh, going to Palenque and La Bonga for the last already 12 years, 13 years, right? The first, the first thing, and I am pretty aware that it, this is not possible all around the globe and not always, but the first thing is to keep the relation with the communities. It doesn't matter if you don't are not doing the research there anymore. Right, it doesn't matter. I mean, because they open the door for you, is that you are, or we are, you know, like achieving our personal goals as well, right? So, and this led me uh, to learn to, with the work with San Basilio de Palenque, and, or I mean, with the Palenqueros and Bongueros, the importance of keep going, but also just uh, like, um, to open spaces, right, in order to think about what does it mean the territory, I mean, to use different, um, let's say, local way, ways of understanding the territory. And, and I'm having a little bit troubles here of explaining myself, but one of the things that I, um, one of the concepts that I use in the research was the idea of scarf, uh, uh, you're right? So a cicatrice in Spanish, right? So scarf, scarf, scarf. So it's a little bit violent maybe, but the reason why I chose that, right, is because that came up through the work with the palinqueros, right? So a scar and a cicatrice on the landscape means different things means the possibility of connecting different stories through time, right? Means also the, the hard historical events connected, connected not only with the past, like the colonial period, but also what is happening right now, right? So um, I, was, I was able to, to enrich my, to enrich my research while I was trying to open this sort of dialogue, right, and letting that the people, uh, the way that they are feeling, interpreting, living the landscape, right, 
push also the interpretation of what I did thinking about the colonial marriage, right? So a cicatrice, a scar is something that we are seeing regularly, right, on the landscape. So it's a sort of inscription that is opening a possibility of connecting with different periods, with different historical events, with different memories, right? And it's a, as an ongoing process, so. Um, I know I don't know. I mean, like if I answer properly your question, Beatrice, but I just wanted to uh, to say that it's important first to work to keep working with the communities. It doesn't matter if we are not doing like research anymore there, right? First, because it's a sort of also of respect that we are showing to the people. Uh, second, it's also important to open the dialogue not only to understand them as a subject of you know like of our research but creating a more fruitful dialogue open dialogue right in order to put in the centrum right the local experiences about what does it means or what does it implies to live in a place like in a palenque i mean like of course we are referring to the present in this case but this is opening right the possibilities to think and imagine also the past so thank you that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. Now, um, another question if uh, people have, I have a few. Oh, looks, we have a question in the chat here. Um, uh, Mariana, did you want to ask that question yourself or have me read it out? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and thank you so much for the talk. This was um, really interesting, and it um, just made me think um, a bit of these communities showcase their their relation to, to somehow either an imagined or a geographical Africa. And I was wondering if you were able to to explore what is the relevance in, in Colombia or at least in these communities of making visible this African ascendancy and this connection to Africa. Is there any relevance or? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mariana, for uh, your question. Well, actually, um, since as a, uh, since the since the 1993, oops, we uh, oh, what maybe yeah. Thank you. Uh, since in 1993, we have a new uh, law in Colombia uh, that was uh, made because of the work right of the. Um, black movement in the 70s and in the 80s. This new law allowed in, in 1993 for the first time the that uh, I mean gave to the communities particular tools that allow them to recognize their settlements, right? The historical inhabiting process of a, of a territory, let's say. And of course, that put over the table the discussion of African diaspora as well, right? So, and also, of course, what happened during the slavery period, right? So, uh, since then, there uh, has been an important, important change uh, in the way of which the communities, the different communities all around Colombia, we are talking about. Uh, 50 to 18 percent of the population in Colombia that recognize themselves as Afro descendants. That is to, I mean, we have to think that Colombia is around 49 million uh, persons or people. So 50 to 18 uh, percent are um, or recognize themselves as uh, Afro descendants. So what? Why the the reason why I'm saying this is because definitely since. Uh, this new law, right? There is an important, um, uh, or the, I mean, to be, uh, to articulate somehow to the African dialogue, right? It's, a, it's a major topic for the communities. Some people could criticize this, you know, like say, like, oh, this, they are taking advantages of academic discussions or whatever, which. But the reality, right, is that what they are doing at the same time, they are trying to live peacefully and to, right, to, to have 
access to the rights that has been denied to them in the last I don't know, 300 years, right? So, so it is possible. So this Africanity is also uh, given them the possibility to show up, yeah, to say, to make them visible and to say like, yes, we are here, <laughs> right? So we have different as well nuances, different situations, not of course, all the Afro-descendant communities uh, inhabitate in the rural areas. So we have a, lo a lot of, of uh, people inhabiting in the main cities, right? And still in Colombia, uh, is there is this idea that the black communities are living on the rural areas, right? So it's something that is like there. So ah uh, yes, so they are connected with ancestral territories, with Africa, and so on. But what's happening with the ones that never grow up? in the rural areas, what is happening to those that are inhabiting the main cities, right? So the thing here is that this Africa dialogue is of, or Africa discourse, sorry, is offering, right, the possibility, the political possibility and final possibility to be visible for the government, to the government, sorry, right? So that is, there is definitely, there is a, a an interest from the communities, right, of using this, of adding this information to their political claims, right? I don't know if I answer with that your no, question. No, that was Mariana. great. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No. Thanks to you. Yeah. Thank you for that question. That was great. Um, and I just here I'll just post this in the chat. Uh, please, uh, you know, register for the next uh, seminar. Uh, next week, but um, I wanted to also, Oliver had to leave, unfortunately, my co-convener had to leave, but he had a question that he was hoping to ask, and uh, he just sent it to me, he's in the archive sending me messages. Um, let's see here, uh, the question is, throughout your work, have you found evidence of the travel of objects, goods, and or information from these maroon communities and other maroon communities in the Caribbean? And he had mentioned uh, as far as indigenous communities, you'd meant, you had talked about uh, the uh, Chim, uh, Chiman, Chimias, Chiman, the Indios Chimias. So. Yes. Yeah, yeah Chimilas, right, Chimilas, right. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, yes. Well, yeah, there, we have here two two different layers. Let's say are correlated, of course, but they are a little bit different. So the first part of the questions are, is related to if I have found evidence of. Uh, the connections, let's say, with other maroon communities from the Caribbean, for instance, or something like that, if I if I understood correctly. So, in the case, in the particular case of San Basilio de Palenque, um, we we have to take into account that what we have now is <laughs> uh, like is the first hand. Um, information archaeological data about a long process of right of creation and the reason why i'm saying this is because there are a lot of questions <laughs> and a lot of analysis that we still have to um to conduct right in order to have a better understanding for instance of the material culture so what what i did in san basilio de palenque and the communal lands and its common lands was to do an archaeological survey, right, in order to identify places. And the reason why I'm saying this is because we need, or I need, <laughs> to do archaeological excavations, right, in order to open, right, the context and to see precisely, or more precisely, the chronological dimension, but also the context of use of that object. Being said that, um, at this point, I do not know, right, if I have or if there is a particular object, right, uh, maybe, but that came along the contract with other maroon, paling, uh, maroon settlements, sorry, I don't know. But what I know based on the analysis of the written sources is that the captions of those maroon settlements were pretty aware about the older maroon settlements uh, that existed, for instance, in Panama, that existed, for instance, for instance, in Jamaica. In particular, not in the case of uh, the Mountains of Maria, but in, from other uh, palenques that also existed at the uh, old province of Cartagena, 
we know actually that we, we have some enslaved that came and maroons were reported that came from Jamaica and settled down, ran away again, and uh, created a new Palenque, right? So we have, and uh, we know that there is this level of connection that we need to explore, right? In order to give, um, uh, let's say, uh, a more detailed answer to the question that Oliver um, have asked, right? But there is, there is, there is this dimension. So, and the second part, this dimension of connections, I mean, and the second part, the relation with the Indians, or, I mean, I'm using the colonial word, right? So with the indigenous, <laughs> sorry, is, um, um, it is, I didn't show that on slides, but I did that, which was to, to understand the location, to analyze, to do an analysis of the location of the Palenques, right? So what we are seeing is that those historical um, maroon settlements uh, emerge in La Sierra, in the mountains, right? But in a, at the moment of when it's happening, this emerge process, I was looking, for instance, of a conflict of lands, right, of the territories, because I was asking to myself, there is this idea, like the indigenous were all around, right, and then came the maroons and occupied lands, right. But when we are looking at the information happening in the mountains of Maria, we don't have this sort of conflicts. And when we look at where we're the Pueblos de Indios, which was this imperial politic of resettlement of the indigenous communities, we are going to see that they are far, far, far away from where these maroon settlements uh, were, right? That is a little bit different from the case of the Provincia Santa Marta, the other side of the river, where I did this mention of the Indios Chimilas, right? What we have that is this regularly um, um, let's say evidence, historical evidence that is that the Palenques looks like that emerged on a territory, right, or on land that was conceived by the indigenous as their lands, right? So we have sort of conflicts. No, that was not the case of the mountains of Maria. Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right. And um, anyone else with a, a, an, another question for Dr. Mantia? I, I have one. Uh, we have, you know, a sh enough time for another question. I have one myself. I don't want to monopolize the time, though. Um, well, okay. So for for my um, research, uh, working in archives, uh, what what um, aspects of this sort of spatial dialectic uh, do you see in the in the sources in the, in the actual archive itself? Do you see uh, depictions, layouts of of uh, anything that maybe this is a colonial gaze? But it's something that is uh, any sign of material ephemera in the archive in the archive that's maybe made its way into the archive that sh helps you puzzle out the or uh, uncover. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for your question, Joshua. Um, what, one of the things, as I mentioned, that I was looking at, when I started this this um, this journey, right, of doing this uh, research, I wanted to look. Uh, uh, the, uh, to the archives, just because, just because I was interested into uh, um, locating particular geographical points, right? So I knew a few things, so I wanted to uh, to look at it. But as soon as I started to work with uh, with the history, with the written sources, I realized that, of course, what we have there is an amount of information. And one of the things that I really, really, really wanted to do, and I achieved in a sense um, while um, anal doing this ana analysis, historical analysis, was understanding the uh, not only the location of the Palenques, right, but understanding how the Maroons understood, right, the place where they were uh, living. Right, and this leads me precisely to focus on the spatial dimension. And this spatial dimension, of course, when you are reading historical sources, you do not have, in the case that I was working, you don't have uh, written documents. I mean, documents written by the Maroons, right? So you have this colonial gaze in between, right? So, and I was then uh, I was focused on the way in which 
the Maroons were referring to their settlements. That was a key aspect. And I'm, I'm, and I'm sharing this because it's important to take that into account when really wishing to, you know, like to achieve, to talk with the others, right? With this, with these Maroons. So I was paying attention to that. And, um, and I was trying to do this on uh, between lines uh, analysis, right? Reading in between because, um, so we have, for instance, many information, I didn't share that uh, with you today, but uh, for instance, that we have a, um, at the end of the 19th century, 17th century, sorry, we know that the majority of the people inhabiting in the Palenques are Africans, right? So 69% of the population are recognize themselves as Africans coming from Central Africa and from Yoruba land or the Yoruba region, right? So, um, and we have another ones, which were the Criollos del Monte, the local, the, the, war, the ones that were born in the, in the Palenques. What is really interesting is that we are seeing how the colonial authorities are pointed out the fact that the Africans, right? So we have uh, Luangos, Congos, Angolas, Araras, Minas, which were the so Coromantes in the English Empire, right? They were using just uh, guns and this sort of weapons, right? While the Criollos were using arrow and bow. And what it looks like something random at the beginning, it becomes clear that what we are talking about here are that these um, objects are pointed out, right? A difference, right? Different arts or possibilities of articulation between of the maroons, right? And something that I didn't mention either today because there was no time is that we are talking about um, uh, the, the usually, not always, but the maroon settlements at least during this period of time are going to be created and articulated from uh, taking into account the origins of the people who run away. So we have Palenques, where the majority of the population is from, uh, or are known at least as Araras and Minas, right? And we have another ones, Angola, Luangos, Congos, that is pointed out its relation with Central Africa. And this, this to summarize, just to summarize that, yes, we have it, uh, like, there is enough information and the written sources in order to catch the materiality, in order to catch the spatiality of the phenomenon, right? So, and I think, as you all of you know, and Jimena is there, Lobo Guerrero also working, right? So, with um, written sources, is a fruitful dialogue in any case for archaeologists. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that question. And um, I'll, have to, I'll have to leave it there, but we can continue on these type of conversations as the yeah. series continues. Uh, wonderful talk. And one more round of applause for our speaker. I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you, everyone, for coming.